Keep yourself in the loop of everything football on the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. The latest news on and off the field, be it college football, Big Ten, SCC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, to the NFL. We've got you covered. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. Welcome in to the GSMC Football Podcast right here on the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Bryce Lewis. And we have more news that I'm going to report today from the NFL. Obviously, draft was last week. We did a lot of draft recapping last week. Now we're still going to do some draft recapping, but obviously more towards regular just how teams have improved and etc uh we'll talk about that today we'll also talk about any major story storylines obviously we're going to talk about Aaron Rodgers and the in the Jordan Love dilemma with Brett Favre coming out saying that he thinks Aaron Rodgers is going to finish his career in another place I'm going to talk about when do you know if it's time to move on from a quarterback before it's too late and they fall off that cliff outside of that we're also going to talk about which rookie quarterback that I think might have the most success this year Andy Dalton is now a free agent, and is it worth tanking for Trevor Lawrence in next year's draft? Some of the best trades that people haven't really talked about too much from the past week during the draft week going into this week. NFL may change their schedule and more right here on the GSMC Football Podcast. But now we're going to start off, like I said, with with the Aaron Rodgers news. Obviously, that's been hitting the airwaves. That's been the big topic. Obviously, when the Packers traded up to 26 with the Miami Dolphins to get Jordan love a lot of people were shocked by this decision and surprised by this decision because of the fact of well you have Aaron Rodgers and you have immediate needs at the current moment in time that need to be addressed so the team can improve and potentially make a playoff run next year well here's the thing about that if you think about this people think the time has now started Aaron Rodgers is now on a clock in Green Bay. Now, with his contract, people have said, realistically, he can't be moved until two years from now, two seasons. Because they could move him that third year, but they hope he would play the third year out of the four years he has left on his deal. And then that will give Jordan Love enough time to be groomed to become the new starting quarterback of the Green Bay Packers. Now, if you look at this in hindsight, in terms of fit with Jordan Love, I think... Jordan Love fits Green Bay because he's a big arm quarterback. Obviously, playing in Wisconsin with cold weather, snow, the tundra, having a guy who can who can really have the arm to wheel his throws, wheel the ball through bad weather is going to be important. So I think he fits it. Also, he's a he's a mobile guy. And listen, people have made comparisons that he could maybe become a Patrick Mahomes esque type quarterback because he has a similar skill set to Patrick Mahomes. We won't know till he actually gets on the field and shows us, but definitely I would think the pairing is a pairing that could work. This isn't something where it's like, oh, he doesn't fit. Obviously, one you can maybe say doesn't fit maybe with more Jalen Hurts when he was drafted by the Eagles, but when it comes to Jordan Love, I think this would work in, in the system that Green Bay has there and has had, so I think that's something we have to look into. Now, in Aaron Rodgers' case, obviously, I feel like if you're Aaron Rodgers, I would be offended by this pick that they made and and obviously he hasn't said anything publicly too much about it but people have said you know privately he isn't happy about it as expected because Aaron Rodgers is a guy who has gotten into it with people in the Packers organization before about moves and decisions that have been made he didn't get along with Mike McCarthy now with this move being made now what is his opinion of Matt LaFleur in, in the in the front office now obviously Aaron Rodgers is going to play his season and he's still going to go out there and compete but, you know, obviously Green Bay right now is relying on a lot of their young receivers to take a step up next year to give Aaron Rodgers the weapons that he needs. Because outside of Devontae Adams, who is more of a possession receiver, you don't really have a reliable guy. Obviously, they had some guys who were injured last year who are going to be coming back this year and another and guys in their second year. So it will be interesting to see if potentially Green Bay can 
get a passing offense surprisingly this year. Receivers can step up and play better and help Devontae Adams out. Obviously, this team is now set to run the football more than ever with the draft picks that they did make, which I think with, with when you have a limited receiving core, if you think about the 49ers last year, their receiving core was somewhat limited. I mean, they didn't really have that true number one guy. Emmanuel Sanders is a good number two, but he's not a number one. And then you had an up-and-coming player in Debo Samuel. Their receiving core was very, very young. So it wasn't like this was a receiving core that struck fear in the secondaries. And I feel like that's the same thing with Green Bay. But it could work because of this. If you're able to run the ball successfully, yes, of course, you know, nobody may threaten you with the receiving core. But you still got Devontae Adams, who still can get open in one-on-one coverage. And, and, and basically, they're adjusting their offense to fit the personnel. Right now, Green Bay has to be a methodical down-the-field offense. They can't be a big play offense. And that's what I think Matt LaFleur is trying to do with the team that they have assembled. With A.J. Dillon and Aaron, Aaron, Aaron Jones and, and everybody. I think they're just trying to create an atmosphere where we can run it, we can eat clock. We still have the two bookends, the two Smiths. And if we can just get a little bit more physical... And like I said, run the football and it's still a physical mindset into the scene. They feel like they can be just as competitive. Nobody's talking about it because, like I said, it's not the big sexy thing of getting a receiver or, you know, Aaron Rodgers. Why would you kind of take that route? A lot of people like to compare his situation to Russell Wilson. So Russell never had a great receiver. Really, he's never had a true number one that was reliable, at least, or not dealing with issues. And he's still been able to be successful. So they're saying Aaron can be successful, too. It's just... We just think, obviously, with guys like Brady and Rodgers and Russell, it honestly should tell you it's not as easy as you think to get premium wide receivers on a team. Like, think about it. It, it feels like in the NFL is this weird dynamic of all the great receivers are on teams that aren't good and all the good, decent, average receivers on the teams that are really good with elite quarterbacks. The only out of the four big quarterbacks between Russell, Tom, Drew, and then if you want to throw in Aaron, Drew's the only one who has like a true number one receiver. I'm talking about Tom Brady with the Patriots, not Tom Brady with Tampa. Obviously, you throw Tampa and Brady in there now, but with the Patriots, he was the only guy who had a true number one guy. You know, Devontae Adams is a great is a great receiver. He would be a dominant receiver if he had another dominant receiver on the other side of him. He's already great now, but he's, he's a possession receiver. And so I think that is what, you know, you look into and you find and 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 you and you look around and see with the entire dynamic in the NFL, you know, because you know Green Bay could go out of their way and get a guy like an Odell or get a guy to 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 really get a big play offense going, but they don't feel as if they need to go out of their way to do that right now, because there's nothing wrong with running a run first, heavy set, multiple set offense, and telling Aaron Rodgers, which you know he can do when you make when you see a play, make it. Make good decisions, get high percentage throws, and we'll win games that way. You know, when Aaron Rodgers was first the starting quarterback, he had all these receivers. They were a big play offense. He could he could throw it all over the yard. Now things have changed. They're becoming more methodical offense. They're not throwing it all over the yard. So of course, when you're used to a certain style of play, it may not be ideal at first. And in Aaron Rodgers' sake, it may not be ideal at first. But we can't look at this high situation and think, oh, because of this, we can't, we can't, we can't win. We can't compete. But at the same time, I also understand, yes, Aaron Rodgers is 36. He's getting older. He said he's getting on the back nine of his career. So I can understand why you may want to be like, can we, can we get some guys here, please? And I know that, hey, if we need to out throw someone, we have the weapons, me, and I think I can beat any other quarterback in this league in a duel where it's like, if we run the ball, it, it cause basically the offense can be designed to be like this. It's, it's they're, they're one of those teams that are designed to be ahead with the type of offense they look like they're going to run this season. They are designed to be ahead. And so since it's designed to be ahead with those receivers, if they get behind, that's when you're going to maybe see a Lamar Jackson Ravens situation where they struggle to, you know, get back because now it's like Rodgers is like, okay, we're down 10, 14. Well, it's not like I can throw us back in the game and we have elite receivers. Like, I can try and I may be able to pull it out my hat one or two times, but I may not be able to do it continuously with the talent we have in the receiving court. Because now all this multiple sets and stuff, 
the running backs are going to be obsolete unless we use them in the passing game. So I could definitely see both sides of the spectrum. I can see why Aaron Rodgers would be frustrated with this, but I can also see why Green Bay has decided to do this. It'll be interesting because literally the good thing about it is, is that they're not forcing him out of Green Bay. Because if that was the case, then there'd be pressure on Green Bay for Jordan Love to hit. At least you're letting Aaron Rodgers play a couple more years there. And then we'll have to see what happens when we get to that third year. Because that will be the year where maybe you might hear some talk about Aaron Rodgers moving. But that's all we have for this segment. Coming up next, we're going to continue on in this conversation. But now talk about how do you know when it's time to move on from an aging quarterback. All that right here and more on the podcast. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project that's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness we're entering that promo code health and wellness are you looking for help for your fantasy football team check out the gsmc fantasy football podcast get today's best advice on who to start who to sit even who you should draft from sleeper picks to red hot lineups they got it all covered for you that's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy dash football dash podcast we'll cover traditional leagues dynasty ppr even idp leagues when you need fantasy help there's just one show to hit up don't forget to like them on facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Football Podcast. Last segment we discussed the Aaron Rodgers dilemma about what what is the future of Green Bay? I stated that I think Green Bay right now is looking at playing a different style of football. They're not going to play the same style they have been maybe accustomed to playing the last few years, where Rodgers throws it 40, 50 times a game. So that that definitely means you need to have receivers who can do it. They're going to take more of a run first. Let's get a lead. Let's waste clock approach, and then let our pass rushers, the two Smiths, get after the passer. And, and, and we're gonna go with that for the for the for the years to come. We'll have to see how it actually translates on paper with the Green Bay Packers. But it'll be very definitely interesting to see the success of the team this year and see how Aaron Rodgers' demeanor is. It'll be interesting to see in press conference interviews. Do you ever hear shots that are thrown? Everything like that. I think everybody's gonna be patient to that, pay attention to that all year long. But now we're gonna continue this discussion, but more in general. How do you know when it's time to move on from an aging quarterback? That is a big discussion I think people wonder about, especially now with quarterbacks playing later into their careers. Before, usually an elite quarterback, if they hit 35, 36, that's when you're like, okay, time to move off, you're getting too old, 
you know, it doesn't even matter if they just came off a good season. You know, it's just like, okay, you're getting to that age where we expect you to decline. So we're going to go ahead and make a move. Now you have quarterbacks playing until they're 40. Obviously, Brett Favre started this playing until he was 40. Now Breeze is playing until he's 40. Brady's in his 40s. Aaron says he wants to play till he's 40. Peyton played very close to 40. So the question is, in, in team situations, when is it a good time or a good decision to move off of a quarterback? Obviously, the first answer is obviously a decline. Obviously, if you notice a decline, then you may figure, okay, we might have to move off this guy. Now, the only thing about declines are it can trick you. And here's how. The thing is, is that when you get older, now everybody's waiting for the decline. So if you have a slightly off season or a bad season, people think that's your decline. That's, that's it. He's going to decline because you just think you'll never have a decline during your prime. So sometimes we'll see one season that isn't great and we will see and say, okay, maybe it's time to get rid of him. Obviously, I like to say you got to look at the situation. What did he have around him? Were there injuries? Obviously, if Drew Brees, Michael Thomas, and Emmanuel and Alvin Kamara went down this year and, 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 and his numbers go down, I mean, we know why his numbers went down. It's not like, oh, he was fully healthy and they went down. It was he lost his best guys and they went down. So you have to look at the situation of why maybe his numbers decreased in those situations. Was it other things that were happening that were affecting him and everything like that? If it's just a clean season where people were healthy and he just simply was just making bad decisions or not showing the same type of play that you've seen before, then yeah, maybe you could say it, it, there's a decline there. You know, obviously as an organization, you you sit there and you're waiting for it to see, okay, when do we start to then in the draft process go ahead and draft that next quarterback? That's kind of the big question. When do you go draft that next quarterback? A lot of people don't know that. When do you draft them? Because I think what happens is you're in a lot of situations where you 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 draft a quarterback usually what most teams like to do third, fourth, fifth round. Guys who may have some talent but needs work, development, consistency, training, coaching. And then, you know, you have the guy you have, and then you play him maybe another year or two, and then give the new guy a chance to then be the quarterback of the future. That's usually what most teams do. The thing is, with Aaron's position, and just like when Aaron was drafted, when you have that quarterback who still feels like he can play three, four more years at a high level or a good level, and then let's say you go ahead and take a quarterback in the first round, you know, I could see why a quarterback's kind of shot because you use such a high draft pick on a guy like that. I mean, look, you saw what happened in New England with, with Belichick and, and Brady and Garoppolo. You know, they took the Garoppolo with the second overall pick, the second uh, round draft pick. That Shocked some people at first. Like, that's a pretty high pick to use on a guy who didn't even play Division One football. Well, he did, but you know what I mean. Like, like FBS football. A lot of people were shocked by that decision. Like, why would you Why would you make that pick? And then you find out when it got to the end of his deal and he was backing up Brady, Belichick had penciled him in as the next guy. From what he had seen, he's like, yep, Garoppolo's our guy. Garoppolo's the future. Garoppolo's who we want. And then obviously we know what happened in that situation and Garoppolo was traded away to the 49ers to be the franchise quarterback of the 49ers. So you you can see since quarterbacks are playing longer into their careers, even drafting a guy at 37 doesn't mean he'll be able to hit the field at, when the guy turns 40, 39. He may still want to play a couple more years. And then yes, when the organization has to come together as a, as, as a group and decide, so do we stick with what we have or do we let this guy go? Because here's the thing. You you draft a guy that you may project as your start, starting quarterback. He's on that rookie deal, four, fifth-year option. You expect to be playing him by the end of that contract so you know. Do we need to re him up or what? Because it'd be kind of weird to draft the guy and he never touches the field. And you never know if he's actually good or not, if he actually can play or not. 
unless somehow over those years maybe the starting quarterback was hurt and then he was able to come into the game and play well. Because what if what if Jordan Love, let's say Aaron Rodgers gets injured week 10, right? And Jordan Love comes in for two games and plays well. People are going to think, oh, the clock is accelerated. They've seen him on the field now. He's played well. Now they're like, we might be able to play him next year. He might be able to start for us next year. Now people are going to have all these questions. Would Green Bay really rush the clock a little bit? Now obviously, again, obviously in Green Bay's situation, the the money in Aaron Rodgers' contract is issued with a cap hit, but it's just going to be a thought. Think about New Orleans' situation. You got Drew Brees, who everybody's expecting this to be his final year as the as the quarterback of the New Orleans Saints. They just signed James Winston's house. When now some people are thinking they might have brought him in to potentially learn behind Drew Brees, learn the system, and then if they like what they see, they might read him up again next year to be the starting quarterback of the Saints. Because it's not like the Saints are out here drafting quarterbacks for him. Obviously, you heard a lot of the Taysom Hill talk, and some people are really struggling thinking you're really going to take a chance on, 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 the, on the season with Taysom Hill as your guy. But now that Jameis has been thrown into the hat, it does create that possibility that maybe Jameis Winston could be the future starting quarterback of the Saints. And listen, that's just another way of showing you you may not have to do it through the draft. You may be able to pick up a guy, and then he could be the guy later. You saw it with Teddy. Teddy has won in this league, had a horrific knee, leg injury, was took a, like almost two NFL seasons to get healthy, then came back, Breeze got hurt, he played, he played well, he was undefeated in those starts, got a big contract, now he's starting quarterback of the Carolina Panthers. And that's really how this goes. There are multiple ways to find the guy, it's just you gotta find the guy. So, it's, it's, it's definitely a difficult decision when you have a guy who's still playing at a good level and, and, and then he's getting older because you never want to be caught with the proverbial he retires and we don't have a plan at quarterback. You never want to be caught in that as an organization because now you may go through a season where it's like, oh, snap. We might have a losing year now because the main guy is gone. You saw what happened with Andrew Luck. The Colts felt like they had a Super Bowl ready roster. Luck retires. They don't even get to 500. It, it really can affect and change the dynamic of your team. That's why you always want some kind of a plan in place to to to, to potentially take over. Like Colts again, Jay Drafter, Jacob Eason, who's the starting quarterback for almost a year, probably Philip Rivers. People think Rivers is going to play one more year, maybe two. By the end of that, Jacob Eason could be the guy. Jacob Eason has talent; he could potentially be the guy. But it's just one of those things that I think that I see, and it's a difficult decision for any organization to make to decide when to move on from a guy. But that's why I think at the end of the day, you just try everything you can to put yourself in position to be ready for that move whenever it's needed. That's all we have here for this segment. Coming up next, we're going to talk about Andy Dalton hitting free agency as the Bengals release him. And is it worth tanking for Trevor Lawrence in next year's NFL Draft? All that here and more right here on the podcast. I want to talk to you guys about this amazing product I've been using lately called Hydrant. If you're like me and you want to kick the coffee habit, but you're worried about your energy levels depleting to avoid the morning sluggishness and that midday slump, you need to make sure you're hydrated. It's super important. And that's where I've been using Hydrant. And for 25% off your first order, you can go to drinkhydrant.com and enter promo code GSMC at checkout. Hydrant is basically flavored electrolyte packets you mix directly into your water to make hydrating your body easy and delicious. And what I love about Hydrant, it's backed by research. The formula was developed by Oxford scientists to provide perfectly balanced, efficient hydration. Again, that's drinkhydrant.com and enter promo code GSMC for 25% off your first order. Another really cool thing about Hydrant, there's no synthetic colors or artificial sweeteners. The formula is vegan and you can choose between three different flavors or a variety pack. So for all my vegan friendly fellows out there, this one's for you. Again, this is drinkhydrant.com and enter promo code GSMC.
Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Football Podcast. Last segment, we discussed when is it time to move on from an aging quarterback? We discussed some of the plans that teams go through to, to be ready for that situation whenever that time comes. Obviously, it's one of probably the hardest situations to prepare for, I think, in the NFL because you, you draft guys or you sign a guy that you think could potentially be the guy after the fact. You got to make sure that he is the guy because you may have had a success steady ship at quarterback for the last few years. Then you bring the new guy in, he doesn't play well, but also you don't want to be caught in a situation where he, or your quarterback is hit over the cliff, he's playing terrible, that ruins the team's chances to win, and then you're looked at as like, okay, why didn't you get rid of him when you had the chance? And, you know, it's just, it's just a big dilemma. It's a big, a big, you know, circus sometimes if you play, if you don't play your cards right. That's kind of the biggest thing I think that everybody goes through when trying to make a decision like this in regards to starting quarterbacks. But now we're going to get into some news and notes. And Andy Dalton was officially released by the Bengals Thursday. And obviously this is a move that has been expected. Andy Dalton was owed about $17, $18 million this season if they kept him. Highly Doubting that they would keep him at that number, especially with the plan to have Joe Burrow to start this year. So they went ahead, released him. Obviously, rumors are running wild about where he could end up. People have been for a long time making the connection to New England that would Bill Belichick take a flyer on Andy Dalton potentially. But one team that has been reported to have very strong interest in him is Jacksonville. And that would be very interesting because obviously they're going with Gardner Minshew. So as far as we know this year as a starting quarterback, and then if they brought in Andy Dalton, would that potentially mean that it's a it's a position battle in camp, or it's 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 Gardner as the starter and then Dalton as the backup, and then you know obviously if Gardner doesn't play well, well we have a guy who's played in this league and Andy Dalton who can come in and play and you know still stay afloat with the offense. So it's definitely an interesting dilemma to see who ends up with Andy Dalton. Andy Dalton has had a very and for the most part, he's had a good NFL career. He hasn't had a bad one. I mean, he went to the Cincinnati Bengals where everybody calls a terrible organization, you know, because they're run like a, a, a small family uh, diner. And, you know, he, you know, Dalton's made Pro Bowls. He's thrown for big yards, you know. But, you know, obviously the last couple of seasons, the Bengals have been lacking talent. Uh, A.J. Green's been banged up a lot, and that's kind of hurt the team. And so now they feel like with Zach Taylor's the new head coach moving forward, they feel like they have to go in a new direction. So I think that's going to be the interesting the interesting situation here is what's going to happen with Andy Dalton and where he ends up. But since Jacksonville is showing very strong interest, it'll be interesting to see is Dalton interested in going to Jacksonville and playing there or is he looking for another opportunity as he would probably be an ideal candidate for a bridge quarterback or a top quality backup? Because, listen, you've seen it with Philadelphia and other teams. Having a quality backup is, 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 is becoming one of the most important positions in the NFL. Because, again, yeah, you might got your top quarterback, but if, you're, if your other quarterback is like, if he comes into the game and it's just like, oh, no. You know, I I feel like there are some teams in this league that know if their quarterback goes down, our backup can't do it and our season's over. (laughs) And I think that's something that I think teams are now starting to look at and think, you know, we need to make sure the quarterback behind us is at least a quality backup and could be an average starter 
which means he can win games if put in the right position and has the right pieces around him. Because sometimes that's all you need him to do is win some games. You don't need him to sit here. Like, I mean, obviously Nick Foles' situation was unique because they had to get him to end the season and get him into the playoffs and then Super Bowl and all that happened. But usually you're just like, if our quarterback goes down week five, he's going to be out to week eight. Can you at least go two and one or three and oh in those, in those next three games and keep us afloat? Because you've seen bad backup play in New York when Sam Donald had mono and you saw how bad the Jets were. You saw back in the early 2010s when, when Bruce Arians was the head coach of the, of the Arizona Cardinals and, 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 and Carson Palmer and all of them went down and Ryan Lindley had to play. You saw what happened. Offense was abysmal. So it definitely shows that a backup quarterback is, is, is definitely needed to be successful in this league. And Andy Dalton is definitely would be a quality backup. And honestly, this quarterback market this offseason has shown us a lot because there are so many good quality quarterbacks. It feels like more in the league now that can at least play. I'm not saying superstar. I'm saying quality guys who can win games and start on teams that are now in the league. You have a lot of them now. The fact that you're having guys like Jameis Winston have to be backups. I mean, listen, yes, James Winston can turn the ball, but he, you, he, he can win games too. He can put up big numbers too. Jameis Winston is probably one of those guys. He comes to the game. Okay, we don't have to change anything. We can still put up the same numbers we put over the other guy. And that's a great luxury to have and a great comfort to have if you're a head coach because you want to know, hey, if we lost our guy, can we at least be 75% of what we were? That may be good enough to still win us games moving forward, and we'll adjust the game plan as such. And now my next topic of this segment, we're going to talk about, is it is it worth tanking for Trevor Lawrence in next year's NFL draft? Obviously, Trevor Lawrence has been touted as one of the, probably the most, the best generational prospects to come out since Andrew Luck, John Elway. A lot of people think already coming out his first year of Clemson, people were calling for him to be the number one overall draft pick. And people feel like he has the arm, mobility, accuracy, uh, anticipation, precision, leadership, everything. He does everything good or great. So now the question is, if you are a team in the NFL, do you tank for a quarterback? Some people have said that maybe the Patriots could be trying to tank for Trevor Lawrence. If you think about the landscape of the NFL, a lot of teams right now kind of have their quarterback position solidified or could be solidified. Teams that in a year potentially could need one, Redskins, if Dwayne Haskins doesn't work out. Potentially Oakland, if the Marcus Mariota, David Carr experiment doesn't work out. Derek Carr. Um, those are two teams off the bat to me that potentially could, you know, if things don't work out, maybe try to get a Trevor Lawrence. Um, maybe Denver, if Drew Locke doesn't work out, obviously a lot of the, some of these teams are going with guys that have shown potential and they're giving them a year. So obviously if Drew Locke works out, then obviously they won't be in the running. You know, there, there, there are some teams out there. There, there isn't as big of a need out there as it used to be her quarterbacks so whoever wants a Trevor Lawrence definitely needs to position themselves to be maybe number one number two overall and the thing about it is if you think about teams that maybe are projected to be bad next year all of them again have young quarterbacks like three teams that people may not expect to be great the Giants the Redskins the Bengals, you know, the Cardinals, potentially the Panthers or the Falcons, you know, all those teams, maybe San Diego, potentially, all these teams, and all of them kind of have a quarterback right now they're either waiting to see or they that they're waiting to see or they feel like is going to be the future of their franchise. So it, it will probably be a team that surprises you. That's why some people think maybe you might have one of those big trade ups next year. Listen, you we really don't know. Would would it be possible teams willing to give up their entire draft to get Trevor Lawrence? We we don't know. 
Because when you have quarterback talents like him who are highly touted, like a Trevor Lawrence, it, it definitely makes even teams that may not even be that bad next year be like, man, what if we could get Trevor Lawrence? Maybe uh, if you have that aging quarterback, you may be like, well, maybe, maybe. Listen, a team that I think could surprise a lot of people next year and potentially get Trevor Lawrence is the Indianapolis Colts. If Phil Rivers does not play well, and he throws a bunch of picks, and the Colts have another bad year. And let's say Eason gets some time, and he doesn't break the bank. Do not be surprised if Indianapolis tries to get into the Trevor Lawrence sweepstakes with the roster they feel like is playoff ready now, and thinks that he will be the key to replacing Andrew Luck, which is one of the best prospects to come out when he came out, and now Trevor Lawrence is. But that's all we have here for the segment. Coming up next, we're going to talk about, in general, which rookie quarterbacks will have the most success this season, in my opinion, right here on the podcast. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Football Podcast. Last segment, we discussed Andy Dalton becoming a free agent now, where he could go, where he would be a good fit, and also brought up the discussion of how important it is and how important it it is now becoming in the NFL to have a quality backup quarterback, almost like another legitimate starter backing up your starting quarterback in the NFL. We also discussed, is it worth tanking for Trevor Lawrence next year? Obviously, I discussed the league is not in the same parallel. Maybe it was five years ago with quarterbacks. Every team kind of has a guy that they're waiting to see or like. There's not a there's not a team this year you're kind of like yeah definitely you know they need one and Trevor Lawrence is the guy obviously we may have some teams in the sweepstakes but a lot of it's going to depend on how the quarterbacks they currently have that they may be waiting to see if our, our quarterbacks do this season so that's definitely going to be interesting to see what happens in both of those situations but now we're going to talk about more rookie quarterbacks and talk about the rookie quarterbacks this year from this past NFL draft. We're going to talk about the main three, Joe Burrow, Tua, and Herbert, and how I see them in their first season as a pro. Obviously, we're going to talk about the number one overall draft pick to the Cincinnati Bengals from Ohio, Joe Burrow. 
obviously we know Joe Burrow from LSU had the, probably the single season statistically the greatest single season any college quarterback has ever had by far none and that earned him the number one overall draft pick selection by the Cincinnati Bengals looks like the Bengals are going all in with Burrow and he is starting day one even through the even through the corona and the workouts and everything he is playing week one so that that brings up the question how will he do when he starts now here's the one thing about the Bengals I think people forget they have Joe Mixon regardless of what you think of the man he is a good quality running back He can run that rock. They have receivers. Tyler Boyd is a good receiver. He's a guy that people sleep on. You know, John Ross, if he can stay healthy, you know, he showed some potential to be a a top receiver in the game. It's just his biggest issue is injuries. If, If he can stay healthy then that could be another weapon, potentially. You know, A.J. Green's coming back. Obviously, if A.J. Green can become what he was, he technically has a number one receiver now. That's three good receivers I just listed to you. So from a wide receiver perspective, and then they drafted T. Higgins in this year's NFL draft. So they have weapons for Burrow. The biggest thing about the Bengals is how good is Zach Taylor as a head coach? The offensive line, can they protect him? And then defensively, remember, when Andy Dalton was drafted to the Cincinnati Bengals in the second round, the Bengals were one of the probably the most complete teams in the league. They had one of the best defenses, and they had weapons on offense. Burrow's not going to that situation. His defense is atrocious, and like I said, they always have had skill position. That's one thing Cincinnati's always had through thick and thin, it seems like, since I've watched football. They've always had skill position players. It's just the rest of the team be a mess. And and so, with 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 we're just looking at the weapons that he has around him, it, it's not like he's set up to fail necessary. It's just the reputation that Cincinnati has, not knowing how good their coaching staff is, and then them playing in such a tough division with Baltimore, Cleveland, and and in Pittsburgh, it, it, it makes you think it's going to be hard for Joe Burrow to have a successful career or at least a cons- successful rookie season. But if he can fight through it and he can make some plays and he can make things some happen, maybe upset a couple of teams, Joe Burrow could be in the rookie of the year at the end of the year, potentially. I think he has the potential to have a good rookie year. If he had a great rookie year, then obviously the Bengals are shocking people. But if a good one should be the, should be what we're looking at. Obviously, you just don't want him to have a terrible year. And now people are wondering... I don't think he should have been the first overall draft pick. We'll have to see. For what we saw in college and what we're going to see in the pros are going to be two different things, and we'll have to see how it turns out on paper. The next quarterback is Tua Tungavailoa. Obviously drafted by the Miami Dolphins at number five, coming from Alabama. Had that horrific hip injury that almost ended his career, but now every doctor is saying he is healthy after surgery and all the other surgeries he's had. People obviously have concerns about his longevity and can he put withstand the punishment that he will take at the next level? Obviously, Miami's been looking for their, ne- their next franchise quarterback since Dan Marino. I mean, listen, we may not look at Tyrion Tannehill as a success or, 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 or a great player, but he has, he was the longest tenured quarterback there since Don Marino. You, you realize that, right? Like he was playing from his rookie year to literally last year. So, well, not last year, but the year before that. So, you know, Tannehill, was, he was able to stick in there a little bit, but wasn't the franchise quarterback they needed. Now they're hoping Tua can come in there and be the guy that they, they need. The franchise guy they can say, take us to the promised land. That's what they're expecting out of Burrow. I mean, not Burrow, Tua. So now Tua's in this position where the question is with him is when will he hit the field? A lot of people think Ryan Fitzpatrick will start again this season. He will be a quarterback of the Miami Dolphins to start. Also, again, because, again, not maybe having enough time to, to learn the playbook and practice and play. 
Plus, also, the way Ryan Fitzpatrick ended the last year, it's kind of one of those things where you feel like you got to at least give him the first dibs on the starting job and, and playing first because of that. I'm sure people are going to debate through the offseason. Do you play him right away? Do you not play him right away? Obviously, with Tua, you want to make sure that he is 100% healthy and cleared and that you trust that he can go out there and take some hits and not go down and re-injure the hip. So, obviously, that's going to be the big the big thing here. I think Tua, if he plays with Miami, Miami's one of the big anomalies of this season to me because they have added so many players and there's so many changes. You don't really know how good the team will be. They could be a great team. They could be an average team. You would think they would be better than last year's team. Listen, and if you're looking at just pure weapons, they got Jordan Howard, a very good young running back. Matt Breida is probably one of the most explosive running backs in the league. And they got him for a fifth round pick for the 49ers in the draft, which we'll talk about in the next segment in terms of trades. You know, so that was obviously big. They have Devontae Parker, who finally emerged as the number one receiver they always thought. The rookie last year, Preston Williams, undrafted from Colorado State, played well. Still got Albert Wilson and Jakeem Grant. You know, Mike Gesicki was coming in, coming on at the end of the last season. And they drafted three offensive linemen. From an offensive perspective, if everybody plays the way that they're capable of playing, this Miami offense can be one of the better offenses in the league next year. So Tua has all the potential in the world to have a very successful rookie year. Very successful rookie year. It's just a matter of timing and just the positioning and how the team is. Because Tua has all the talent in the world to, to really set this league on fire if he gets a chance to play next year. And lastly, Justin Herbert. Obviously, I think the Chargers right now with Justin Herbert, I think they're going to ease Justin in there. I think Tyrod will probably be the starter going into next year. Tyrod Taylor is not a bad player. He has won games in this league. He has a winning record playing with Cleveland and Buffalo most of his career. He 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 can he can play. So I don't want people looking at this like, oh, it's Tyrod. Oh, Justin Herbert will beat him out easily. Listen, this is where me and my my my, my partner Ethan sometimes differ. You know, he thinks Herbert's going in day one. I think that he's gonna he's going to play, but not right away. Because that's usually how a lot of quarterbacks play. Remember, Baker didn't play right away. Lamar didn't play right away. Patrick didn't play right away. A lot of guys still don't play right away. It's just they play early because the quarterback ahead of them doesn't play well. And I think that's going to be what happens with Justin Herbert. And when Herbert gets in there, the Chargers have probably one of the best rosters out of all three of these teams that the rookies have been drafted to. So he definitely has the most ex- ability to be successful in his first year if able to play. But he's also under the most pressure because if he, since they have talent, if he struggles or doesn't play well, people are going to now start to question, can he be the guy? Was it a mistake to to draft Justin Herbert? And do they may need to look into, like they said, the Trevor Lawrence sweepstakes the next year or anything else going into the future? So that's my opinion on what the three quarterbacks will do this season. And, and it will be interesting which one has to actually end up being most successful by year's end. But coming up next, we're going to talk about some trades that a lot of people don't talk about that have happened this past week. You know about them, but we're going to go more in depth about them right here on the podcast. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Football Podcast. Last segment, I discussed the three main rookie quarterbacks we drafted this year. 
who has the potential to play in their first year, and I discuss their situations and who might be set up to have the most success when coming in from their perspective teams. Obviously, as like we know, Joe Burrow will definitely start week one for the Cincinnati Bengals unless something changes. Tua could start week one, but we'll have to see. Like I said, I think Ryan Fitzpatrick might get that call because of of the fact that you want to make sure Tua is healthy and plus how he ended last season. And obviously, again, the same thing with the Chargers. I believe Tyrod Taylor will start the year. But I do feel like Justin Herbert will hit the field at some point this year. And I told, also said that, you know, he also is somewhat under the most pressure because he has the most talent out of all three of those teams. And so he will be more in position to be set up to be successful if play if he does actually play. So now we're going to talk about some moves that have happened this past week that nobody really have talked about. Really draft day trades and trades that I think made teams better. Um, we're going to break them, discuss them here right here on the podcast because there, like I said, there are some trades that were made that nobody's really talked about during all this draft hype, but I think really can make a difference for these teams. Obviously, last time when I talked about Matt Breida going to the Miami Dolphins, and Matt, Miami Dolphins acquired Matt Breida from the 49ers for a fifth round pick. I feel like that is an absolute steal. Obviously, if you watched the 49ers last year, they had three running backs, Tevin Cota, Matt Bremen, and also, and Mozart. Matt Breida and Tevin Coleman and Mozart all had their, their days in the sun. Obviously, Mozart finished the season, Tevin started the season, and Breida was good in the middle. Breida is probably the most explosive running back out of all of them. And Miami picked him up. Obviously, Miami needed a second running back to go with Jordan Howard, who's more of a one-cut power back, give you good quality yardage. Now you got Matt Breida, who you can spread out at wide receiver and also can break the top off of a defense. Obviously, this will help out if you do, like I said, go with Tua, give you a, a, a two-dimensional running game. You see that with a lot of running back groups nowadays. You always want that explosive guy, and then you want that grinded-out guy. You don't usually want two of the same. You want like, okay, he can do this, and then he can do that, unless you have a running back who could do both, like a Shaquan Barkley or a Derrick Henry. So I think the Matt Breed trade will add very good value to Miami's offense. Uh, so listen, Matt Breida is kind of on a one-year prove-it deal because he has a year left on his contract. And if he has a big year in Miami, I don't see why Miami wouldn't want to keep him around. Unless somehow the money that maybe he might get from other teams potentially is a lot. I, but I definitely think Miami, the way they're looking as an organization, especially with the new direction that they're going in, if their trade for Matt Breida ends up panning out very well for them, I don't see why they wouldn't sit here and, and, and resign him to a deal. Because he's young, as most of the players they have signed or tra- obviously drafted, they're all young. So it's a guy that, you know, he can play like this for years to come. He doesn't have really anywhere on the tires. So he's someone you could definitely maybe start, you know, and obviously sharing a backfield. You can definitely invest some time and energy and money into potentially if you wanted to keep him around long term. Another big trade that happened that nobody talked about was the 49ers acquiring Trent Williams. Obviously, if you know the situation with Trent Williams, Trent Williams has been very disgruntled. Since the beginning of last year, not played this entire year for the Washington Redskins. He's had some injuries. Him and the team have not seen eye to eye on those injuries. And he does not want to play for Washington anymore. And Washington knew it. So they proceeded to trade him away for a fourth round or a fifth round pick, I believe. And remember, Trent Williams is a Pro Bowl caliber left tackle. So the Point Irish just picked up one of the best tackles in the league. If he can get healthy. Remember, they just lost Joe Staley. And now you found a guy to replace him with another Pro Bowl talent. Obviously, the 49ers, this is going to help them. Because first, Trent Williams gets to put into a winning environment. Because remember, he never really went or won in Washington. So that will also maybe change the demeanor. And, and, and things. Because listen, playing in a losing environment can, can sometimes really you know bring down a... A player, it may pre- change your approach to the game because, you know, like, you know, you're going out there every week and you're just like, man, we're not that good. Do, do I really want to go out of my way for a team that's not even going to be that good? 
I don't know if I like the coaches. I don't know if I like these plays. You know, you start having a lot of questions. And now you're going to a winning organization like the San Francisco 49ers, especially coming off a Super Bowl berth last season. It, I think Trent Williams will definitely try everything he can to help this team win and be put in a great position. And also for the 49ers, it's just great because now you get you keep Garoppolo's side protected. You you now have the ability to, you know, do what you got to do on both sides of the ball. And and, just, and and really, that left tackle position, man the line of scrimmage. Trent Williams is a big man. So they can still incorporate a power running game with Trent Williams. And, and they could just continue to operate the same way they've operated for the past few years as they put a lot of investments into their lines of scrimmage. So this definitely puts them in position to continue to have probably one of the best offensive lines in the league. So I think that's something that definitely, definitely was a big move for the 49ers to get a guy like Trent Williams. Because Trent Williams is a guy who, like I said, at the best, at his best, is a pro bowl left tackle in this league. And and finally, again, all these trades, 49ers have been active. The 49ers traded Marquise Goodwin to the Philadelphia Eagles. And I think that was a huge trade for the Eagles. Because the 49ers really just got a pick out of it. They didn't get too much out of it. They were just willing to let go of Marquise Goodwin. Obviously, Marquise Goodwin was injured last year. He was proverbial before Manuel Sanders, the number one receiver they had. Obviously, he was hurt. They decided, okay, we were going a different direction. We want to move on. And now the Eagles, also with picking up Jalen Rager in the first round, now have added them two speedy receivers. And Marquise Goodwin could be the best friend of Carson Wentz this season. I definitely see the potential there with 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 that. That Carson Wentz and Marquise Goodwin could become a very great combination with him and Jalen Rager. And thing we have to think about is they still have a Deshaun Jackson. They still have Alshon Jeffrey. You know, so they, they they now what was a weakness last year is now is now a strength. It, it is now a strength for the Philadelphia Eagles, and that's all you want. Like I said, when you have a guy like Carson Wentz on your team, you you want talent you want guys who can play you want guys who can go out there and compete they you could say they have probably one of the best cores in the league with Alshon and Deshaun and Jalen and Greg Ward Jr. they still got Whiteside Goodwin you know they have a lot of receivers on this team that can play so definitely you know there's a lot of talent here and like I said the Eagles are probably going to be one of the best teams in the NFC, in my opinion, next year. And like I said, making this move really solidifies their receiving core, gives Carson Wentz weapons, and now they have... If Deshaun Jackson can get back healthy, I mean, you really have three big play receivers on your team. And that's going to make them extremely dynamic, extremely dynamic on the offensive end. Alshon Jeffrey can get happy. You know... He has that jump ball ability, big, tall, red zone receiver. And then, you know, you can use Greg Ward in certain situations. And then, boom, you know, Philadelphia could be one of the top offenses in the league potentially next year because of all of the talent that has been accumulated. And and generally, just with all the trades that I've mentioned, you know, there's always that one move or that one trade sometimes a team makes that doesn't get much media attention. But ends up being a move that could be the difference between them winning and losing big games. You Sometimes you don't see it sometimes initially at first if we don't report it as a big deal. But that's why if you pay attention enough and you really know maybe what a player could do, you can see the potential that a player could potentially possess and how it could help a team moving forward and how it could really push them over the top and be successful in the long term, moving forward. I think that's going to be the biggest thing, you know, that you can take away from moves like the Marquis Goodwin trade or the Matt Breida trade. But that's all we're going to have right here for this segment. Coming up next, we're going to discuss the NFL potentially moving the NFL to Saturdays for some games of the college football season campus. And we'll also talk about what if 
the college football season camp cancels. All that right here and more on the podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Welcome back to the GSMC Football Podcast. Last segment we discussed. What trades in the NFL that people never talked about that happened during draft weekend which might affect teams in a very critical way? I talked about three trades. All of them had to do with the 49ers. The 49ers were very active from a trade front during that week. But all these trades benefited the teams and potentially you never know what move could really be a reason why a team is potentially in the Super Bowl hunt late in the season. It may not seem like a big move now, but then seeing how things come together, you'll sit there and be like, oh, okay, now that move looks like a genius move by this GM. So, obviously that's going to be a something to look out for to see how these trades actually work out on the field when we touch down in September or whenever the NFL the season starts to start. But talking about the season, obviously with this coronavirus pandemic, we don't still have an idea what if football is going to start on time, what it's going to look like or anything. So basically, here's the thing. The, 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 the big thing here is you've heard on multiple occasions if the students aren't back on campus, some colleges will not have a season. Some, and I believe that's how most colleges are. If we don't have our students back on campus, why are we starting a season? Now, they might still do the season without the students on campus, but that that is something we'll have to see. Because obviously, you know, you don't want your student athletes to get infected with the virus because you wanted them to practice for the team. So you got to be careful about your approach. So that obviously makes some young people wonder, could potentially the college football season be canceled? Could it be postponed to a certain part? Can you even do that with college sports? Can you postpone the season till half October, November? It's one of those types of things where you're, you're unsure what's going to happen. So the NFL has already started thinking about what they would do if said decision was made to cancel the season. They might start putting some, I don't know how many, but I'm sure maybe one or two or three games from their usual Sunday slate on Saturday. Because obviously, you know, during the college football and NFL season, that's like prime weekend football week. Football's on all weekend. All I'm watching is football all weekend. Right? So... If you if, if 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 that's the case, the NFL wants to keep that alive. Plus, also remember, since they're going to be the only football on, if that happened, if they still went ahead with their season, ratings might go up. And like I said, they don't even have to put all their games on Saturday. They can put like just three games. You know, I'm sure they're going to take maybe some of the one o'clock games. You might, and you're obviously maybe have potentially two prime game games. You may not. You may only have a one and a four o'clock game. But they're going to put some games on Saturday, which would be interesting. Obviously, if you can tell from previous years, when the college football season's like play, like regular season ends, and there's that gap between then and the bowl week, you notice that that's when the NFL starts having games on Saturday during that. So clearly, this is just more permanent for, okay, well, if there's no games on Saturday, now we're going to have them all over every week of our season during the season. Obviously, Saturday NFL games. I mean, listen, that's the night. That's the day for college. Now it's the day for pro professional, both Sunday and and Saturday. Some people prefer college than pro, so some people may not watch it, but some they may because it's like, well, this is this is the only this we can still have football night. We can still have football tailgates. We can still have all the good stuff. It's just we're going to be watching NFL instead of the main professional. Obviously, 
it will be interesting if they did it because the NFL is skated to release their schedule in about a week, I believe. So if they did make a decision like that, obviously we'd have to see how they flex that schedule. Again, if they did this with no fans, then obviously they could easily flex it because, you know, it's just, okay, yeah, we're just going to play a day early. And we can make that decision maybe earlier in the week or before the season starts or whenever college football decides to make that decision to potentially cancel if they did go ahead and decide to cancel the season. So obviously NFL would definitely, you know, look at this and say we can get more football now on more days because they already have a football game Monday. They have a football game Thursday and then they have a football game Sunday. And then if you add Saturday, that's four days out of the week, you have NFL football. Now, if we turn this over and if we flip it over on its side, and now we look at the college football aspect, how would that look? How would that be if we didn't have college football? Obviously, college football is a very loved sport. College football is a sport that's more niched than the NFL. NFL is more of a just a national, it's really a national football. Like nationally, people watch it and have favorite teams in different states. And if college football is more, you you can still have fans from other states, but usually, for the most part, you usually stick to teams that at least live within your state. And obviously, if you go to that college, you're usually a fan of it most of the time, not all of the time. Like, think about it. Usually, SEC football is pretty big. Everybody in Alabama pretty much is either an Allbird or an Alabama fan. It's a niche crowd. You don't really have a lot of Alabama fans in California. You don't have a lot of Auburn fans in New York. You may have like one or two, usually maybe somebody who migrated from Alabama up there. Maybe, you know, I mean, listen, in the South, there is more fans probably of SEC schools that don't live in those respective states. But outside of that, you know, that's pretty much how it is. You know, Ohio State, you know, usually everybody in Ohio State, you know, is a fan or Ohio is a fan of Ohio State. And then obviously you have the lower colleges like Ohio and, you know, Miami, Ohio and those schools. But NFL, college is more of a niche crowd, niche fan base. So obviously what you're losing if you lose college football is you're losing all of the people who want to support their team, cheer their team. College football, you could, people say thinks is a more, uh, as a more lit sport, is a more exciting sport to watch. You know, me and my brother very much differ on this. He thinks, that college football is boring unless it's like the big national championship game or the playoff games. He thinks they're boring. He, he feels like there's no there's nothing interesting about the games. He only prefers to watch the NFL. I feel like both of them, because I'm a fan of both, both have their own values and both bring something different. I feel like college football is more of a prestigious feel to it of, you know, listen, college football, of course, there's games that you watch. And you're just like, you can tell by the way this game is, this is not an important game. Plus, there's so many of them, you can feel that way. But it's a lot of football, where if you love football enough, you know every every day, all day on Saturday, you have multiple games you can watch. And if all it takes is one of those games catching your interest, and then you're hooked. For NFL, you have a very strict time clock. NFL is more to your state for the most part. You know, obviously, if you live in the state, you get the local game all the time. Any state that doesn't have a local team usually gets whoever the closest affiliated team is. And, you know, that audience watches that. So NFL obviously gets pretty big ratings. College gets ratings. I mean, college football would definitely be missed. College football is a very beloved sport. You know, it's it's just, it's a sport that truly is big time. And obviously there's been news about the NFL, the NCAA getting ready to vote in January on letting players get paid for their likeness. And now everybody's getting hyped about maybe the NCAA football coming back potentially. We don't know if that's going to happen. There's still hurdles they have to come overcome, but obviously that would maybe take a next step. Obviously that's more because of what's happening in the G League and, and basketball, but that could obviously benefit in a, a college football players. And, you know, it's just going to be very interesting to see how this all turns out and how this all comes together. I definitely hope the end of college season does not get canceled. I just think it's just perfect every weekend, you know, get your dose of college, watch the next coming stars of tomorrow, then you go see NFL, and then watch to see who's competing, who's going to win, who's going to win the Super Bowl. Both people, both sides of the of the spectrum are great. College is just, it's, it's a different experience, and it's an experience that is very valuable to have if you are a college football fan, and that's why you, you love the sport every time it comes back around when September hits, usually they start at the end of August, but usually September, 
you know, when it really goes full throttle, it's it's definitely one of the most exciting times of the year, in my opinion, to watch college football. And hopefully, hopefully, they don't. They already have some plans in place, potentially. They, they have this six-week program that they, they're they trying to vote on. If we can get six weeks before the season starts, they can go ahead and do the season. But we'll have to see, like I said, what actually ends up happening at the end of the day when it comes to the college football season and where they stand with that. But that's all we have here for you on the GSMC football podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Hope you had a good time, had a good listen to the show. Definitely want you back for the next show. If you have any if, any, any thoughts about this show, please follow us on social media. and on, We are on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Also, don't forget to leave a review. I always appreciate any of comments. And, you know, I'm always here for constructive criticism. And also, don't forget to listen to our other amazing podcasts here on the GSMC Podcast Network. This is Bryce Lewis signing out. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program